city or even on the floor. Um, as you all well know, a couple years ago, there was a Supreme Court ruling that shut off the funding mechanism for the sheriff's pension. Uh, basically, that has uh, put them in a dire position. So this is a temporary fix that will allow, uh, allow us to give them the, the necessary language to start paying 5% into a temporary system as well as receive funding at the discretion of the Missouri legislature to get them through until a permanent funding source can be found. I will note that um, this particular language was in 934. We did make a fix. I think that's been delivered to your office for a committee substitute, uh, and so that should take care of that part. Um, this also includes House Bill 222 from Representative Owens. It was an amendment that was added. It deals with the offset of the Missouri State Highway Patrol Emperor's Board uh, system for whenever they are elected. Currently, the at-large members are elected uh, all at the same time every four years. That institutional knowledge loss uh, is causing, you know, could cause problems. So we want to offset those where there'll be two, and then two years later, another two would be reelected. That would establish that and allow it to do go under that. Uh, the next one would be House Bill 303, which was attached as an amendment. Uh, this deals with um, the St. Louis City Police Officers Retirement System. Currently, and I think they're the only systems like this, if you're a spouse of a member that dies, whether it's in the line of duty or afterwards, uh, you can draw a pension, but if you remarry, that pension is then suspended. And so what this particular bill would do is waive that. Um, none of the other pension systems do that that I'm aware of. So it's basically kind of a marriage penalty. So we want to try to change that statute for them so that if a, a widow did remarry after losing their spouse or loved one, that they could continue to draw that pension as they move forward. Uh, the next one that was added was uh, House Bill 257 by Representative Pollock. Uh, this mirrors uh, pretty closely uh, Senate Bill 75, which deals with um, several different things, but the teacher's retirement system, critical needs shortages, and some things along those lines. Uh, and I think maybe I got a little confused. This is the one that's got the two-year retirement offset on it. So, and then I'll move on over. There's another House bill on here, which was House Bill 155 from Representative O'Donnell, uh, which deals with the Show Me Retirement Savings Administrative Fund. Um, and there's some more I can talk about on that. The other amendment that was placed on there was House Bill 512, uh, and this is a reauthorizing deduction from federal adjusted gross income, uh, dealing with. Um, this here's got something to do with their investments, uh, private investments as far as retirement. And this basically reestablishes that um, adjustment there from the federal gross income, which is a tax deduction. Uh, Representative Steinhoff uh, put an amendment on here, and this deals with speech language pathology assistance. They're calling them implementers now. Apparently, some of our speech pathologists in our schools, this deals with the teacher system. Some of them are certified, and they are under the PSRS part. Others are not certified, and they're under the Pierce part, and this language will help address that so that they can continue to move forward with the way that they are, I guess, identified uh, in that particular system now. And the last one was House Bill 1185, which is a bill that I had offered, and it's been around for a few years, too. Uh, this is cleanup language for the Emperor's Board and the Moser's Board, um, and I can talk about each one of them, but if we go into this cleanup language, which is uh, identifying several things that needed to be fixed, it's about three pages long, just the summary. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and uh, establish a quorum real quick. Matt, please call the roll for general laws. Senators Burnscatter. Here. Present. Searpoy. Present. Beck. Black. Here. Present. Bratton. Huff. Razor. Here. Present. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. Okay. Uh, anybody testify in favor of... A representative Hose Bill, please come forward. Melissa Lortz with the Missouri Sheriff's Retirement System. We are in support of this bill. Obviously, it originated as our short term fix to help us with our funding. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Mike Wood, registered lobbyist for the Missouri State Teachers Association, here to talk about the PSRS provisions. We think this helps um, districts fill critical shortage areas. Uh, everybody's short of staffing right now, especially in our schools, and this will be able to do it without putting a uh, burden on our retirement system. So we're in support of the legislation. Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? 
Please come forward. Anybody for opposition? Anybody for informational purposes only? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Scott Simon. I'm the executive director of the MoDOT Patrol Employees Retirement System. Uh, I would be here in support of this bill, uh, at least with regard to the provisions uh, that Representative Hovis re referenced with regard to what I would call the staggered terms bill that does adjust the terms of our elected officials, our elected trustees on our board, uh, and staggers those every two years to maintain the institutional knowledge. And then furthermore, with regard to the cleanup language that he referenced for both Mosers and Impers, uh, we'd be in, in support of that. Can't really speak to the rest of the bill, but we would wholeheartedly support uh, your consideration for those two pieces. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else for informational purposes only? Abby Spieler, Executive Director of Missouri State Employees Retirement System, here for informational purposes only. As Scott mentioned, we are supportive of the cleanup bill and the, I think, Senate Bill 77, or Senator Black's bill is also a House amendment here, and the board is supportive of that. The only the board has not taken a position on House Bill 222, which is allowing a legislature to come back, work full time, and continue to receive their retirement benefit. That is a plan change. It would be a very minimal cost to the system, but it would be a cost, and the board has not taken a position on that yet. So. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Anybody else for informational purposes only? That concludes the hearing on House Bill 934. Representative McGaw, please come for House Bill 782. Thank you very much for hearing my bill. I appreciate it. I am Representative Peggy McGaw. I am still in the honeymoon stage of trying to re uh, replace Representative Rusty Black. And so this is uh, my first time for um, this bill. It was presented originally many times in the House by Representative Andrews, also from the North, Great Northwest. And sweet and simple, it's one of the simple bills you'll have. It's about newspapers being able to accept notices. Currently, in order to qualify as a legally acceptable newspaper to run public notices and advertisements. A newspaper must have been published regularly for a period of three years or must be the successor newspaper to a defunct newspaper and begin publication no later than 30 days after the termination of the prior newspaper. So this bill reduces the time period of regular publication from three years to one and increases the time period from 30 days to 90 days within which a successor newspaper must begin publication. The bill also allows a newspaper that has been purchased or newly established by another newspaper that satisfies these conditions to qualify. So the bill is the same as House Bill 2289 from 2022, and with that I would take questions. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody testify in favor, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mark Mawson with the Missouri Press Association, representing the over 200 newspapers in the state. We've met with the bill sponsor and we want to thank the representative for introducing the bill. Our Missouri Press Association board has also agreed to this language. Regarding the 30-day to 90-day successor period, recently in past years, the newspaper in Willow Springs in Howe County just shut down one day. And actually, uh, former state treasurer Wendell Bailey was in search of someone to take over that newspaper. That is his hometown. And finally, on the 28th day after it closing down, he found owners to take it over and start that paper up. We just think that it might be um, more advantageous if they had a little longer time frame to be able to start that successor paper from 30 days to 90 days. <clears throat> the bill also changes the length of time while a new newspaper can publish before uh, it accepts public notice advertising. It shortens that length of time. I'll give you an example. In the past few years, we always hear of newspapers that are closing, but there's been newspapers that have also started up recently. Uh, the Mary's County Advocate in Vienna 
uh, the Tribune and Times in Harrisonville and the Phelps County Focus in Rolla. Those were all newspapers that have started up but had to publish three years before they could ex start accepting uh, public notice advertising. And I did a straw poll and looked at a lot of other states, looked at 17 different states, and 11 of them have it only as one year, which is what we're proposing, and we were by far the longest at three years. So this actually makes it easier for a new newspaper to start publishing, and it encourages that action. We willing to take any questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Senator Serpoy. Thank you. What like why they should do it for uh, one year before they can accept it? Well, I think it goes back to from what I... Yeah, due diligence. Also, I can give you an example. This bill was put into effect in 1937, according to my predecessor, mm -hmm. Mr. Cruz. Uh, not that he was around then, but anyway. Uh, in 1937, this bill was put into place because there was a newspaper that started up right before the election to get election advertising in 1936 and was only open for a few weeks, got the advertising, and a few weeks later shut down. Okay, so this is to make it, to be able to accept legal advertising, the due diligence is they have to publish for 52 weeks before they can start accepting it. Okay, well I don't know why we make them advertise the papers at all. I don't know if anybody reads that stuff. But anyway, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Anybody testify against? Anybody for informational purposes only? That concludes the hearing on House Bill 782. Up next is House Bill 136. Representative Hudson, whenever you're ready, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to present this bill to you today. For the record, Representative Brad Hudson, Representative District 138 in the Missouri House, here to present House Bill 136, which passed out of the House, was third read and passed by a vote of 108 to 42. HB 136 is a short, narrowly written bill that solves a very specific problem. Since 2010, across the country, belief-based student groups on many public university campuses have been told that they have to change their beliefs in order to be registered as a student organization. Last year, the Missouri House passed a similar bill to this one. I carried that one as well. That was House Bill 1724. Uh, it was passed by a vote of 95 to 36 in the House last year. That bill was then voted due pass by the Senate Education Committee, uh, but it was too late in the session to make it to the Senate floor. Adverse action by college against belief-based student groups has resulted in unnecessary and costly litigation between students in their own universities. For example, as recently as 2021, after a ruling by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals against the University of Iowa, that state was forced to pay a judgment of almost $2 million. That case began in 2017 when the university told a small evangelical campus ministry that they were not allowed to require the leaders of the group to agree with its statement of faith. In 2016, a similar issue arose at SEMO. While it was ultimately resolved without litigation, faith-based student groups were forced to retain legal counsel in order to protect their First Amendment rights against a threat from a Missouri public university. This should never have to happen. So far, 17 states have passed legislation like HB 136, designed to protect students and to protect taxpayers as well. Unsurprisingly, Iowa is now one of those states, as are our neighboring states of Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Protections that go even further than my HB 136 passed and were signed into law in Indiana last year. That bill passed with unanimous bipartisan support in both chambers of the Indiana legislature. And as demonstrated, when Governor John Edwards, a Democrat, uh, signed a similar bill in Louisiana, there is no reason that promoting pluralism need to be a partisan issue. HB 136 is designed to protect a long-standing practice in Missouri where student groups of all creeds and points of view are free to operate as registered student clubs and to require that their leaders adhere to the group's sincerely held beliefs. This is really just common sense. A pro-choice club should not be required to let a pro-life student serve as its president, and a Baptist student club should not be required to let an atheist teach its Bible studies. 
While this really would seem to be just common sense, in today's world sometimes common sense has to be put into statute to avoid litigation that should never have to happen in the first place. I've tried to keep my introduction as brief as possible. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. If not, I'd be happy to get out of the way and let uh, some of our witnesses speak. Questions? Representative Razor, go ahead. Thank you, Representative. I think common sense tells me that I don't see a whole lot of atheists running to join the Baptist group, and I don't see a whole lot of Muslim students running to join the Catholic group or a whole bunch of gays running to join some group that doesn't like them, much less run for their leadership. So is this, have we been seeing hostile takeovers of these groups across the country? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm aware of any hostile takeovers. I tried to articulate in my introduction, uh, Senator, uh, with regard to the situation that happened in Iowa, um, also with regard to the situation that happened at SEMO. Uh, I think the issue here, more than what you might would describe as hostile takeover, uh, is uh, student groups being able to register in the first place and have these requirements and be accepted. So these student groups receive some funding from the university. They're able to use facilities on campus. And it seems to me the universities are saying to me, we're not going to have groups that we give your tuition money to or your tax money to that specifically exclude you. Now, that doesn't mean I want to go join them, but I couldn't have a group that specifically excludes you using your tuition and tax money. That doesn't make sense. That's common sense. Uh, and so I, I think if you're, if you're using state money, if you're using tuition money, it's fair to say you need to be open to all, even though all don't want to come and join you. With respect, Senator, and, and, and I appreciate what you're saying there, but the United States Supreme Court has made it clear for over 20 years that no student group can be denied access to funds because of what they believe. So this is actually, with regard to resources and the ability of students to exercise their freedom of association on college campuses, this is an issue that has been settled in the judicial branch. They can have access to funds. They can still believe what they want without having an exclusionary policy. They they can have access to funds, they can believe what they want, and they can require that their leaders adhere to the group's sincerely held beliefs. I believe that is already, when you look at case law, uh, when you look at the First Amendment, I believe that is already the case. What I'm merely trying to do, Senator, is codify what the First Amendment and case law already allows. If you want to grow your group, this is a fine way to not do that. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Anybody testify in favor, please come forward. Good morning. I want to say thank you to the chair and the committee for considering this valuable and important piece of legislation. I'm speaking primarily in favor of uh, House Bill 136 uh, from a religious liberty perspective. My name is Curtis Cole and I serve with Chi Alpha Campus Ministries USA. Chi Alpha has seven chapters on local campuses in the state of Missouri and 275 chapters across the country. Everyone is welcomed at our meetings. Everybody is invited to participate. Our students conduct worship services on campus, organize non-alcoholic social and service activities, and participate in numerous annual missions trips uh, across the country and around the world, committed to improving the lives of others. Chi Alpha is the campus ministry arm of the Assemblies of God Church in America and in Missouri. There are 445 Assembly of God churches with an attendance of 122,000 people on an average week. First, a bit of national context, and then just wrap up with Missouri in particular. For many years, Chi Alpha chapters have repeatedly faced being kicked off public school university campuses around the country, including right here in our home state of Missouri. 
Sister organizations have been kicked out of the University of Iowa and off campus at Wayne State University, resulting in years of expensive and difficult litigation. Why? Simply because these religious groups ask that their student leaders will embrace their faith. But that's a common sense standard that any reasonable person, I would think, would embrace as well. Here are two specific examples of where our groups have been harmed specifically. At the University of Virginia, our local chapter was ridiculed at student government meetings and in the student newspaper for simply holding biblically-based views and standards for leadership. Later, our chapter of over 425 active students was threatened with losing its club status. Out west at Wenatchee Valley College in Washington State, our local group was kicked off campus because of its association with the National Assemblies of God Church. Kicked off campus. So why is House Bill 136 so crucial for Missouri? In the simplest terms, Missouri students should be able to follow their sincerely held religious beliefs and organize their student clubs around those sincerely held beliefs. This means religious groups should be able to have religious leaders. College administrators are facing pressure by student governments and activists demanding that religious groups be expelled for their religious beliefs. Those administrators need a clear and firm rule like House Bill 136 that gives them the foundation to push back against voices demanding unconstitutional discrimination against religion. This legislation is valuable because it's also proactive instead of reactive. Instead of waiting for these issues to surface at Mizzou or Missouri State University, this legislation clearly strengthens the definition of, was, of what it means to be religious and free in Missouri. Imagine with me students on our local campuses worshiping their God in, in, uh, uh, in, a, in a campus setting in freedom. Imagine with me a place where young leaders are encouraged to respect and honor religious practices that may be unique and different from their own belief systems and are educated to view diverse groups as inherently constitutional. I believe if we pass House Bill 136, Missouri will become just such a place on our college campuses. Thank you very much. Open for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Senator Razor, go ahead. Was it the University of Iowa? You were saying they were kicked off campus? They were, yeah. What, that was. What was the belief that they were kicked off campus for having? They wanted to have leaders who um, adhered to biblical values and standards for leadership, and the university told them at the time they could not do that. They had to um, be open in terms of leadership to any other uh, possible student on campus. Were they being, was there a hostile takeover coming towards the group? It was a small group, uh, business leaders in Christ. It was called Blink for short. And that is one example of, yes, where they were, they were removed from campus by this university administration. Blink was trying to take them over? No, Blink was the group that was trying to be, uh, that was kicked off of campus. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Please come forward. Good morning, my name is Timothy Faber. I'm with the Missouri Baptist Convention. Um, we represent 1,800 churches across the state of Missouri, about 300,000 Missourians. And um, I'd like to start by saying, I agree with everything the previous witness said. Um, we have Baptist- Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Any questions? Um, may I finish? Well, I thought you were done. You said you agreed with everything you just said. Well, I was gonna add some to it. Okay. Okay. Um, we have Baptist Collegiate Ministries on a number of campuses around the state of Missouri. And so um, this is a religious liberties issue, but um, I would also uh, mention that the courts have determined that freedom of association is a, an inherent right of Americans, both in religious as well as cultural and other issues. Uh, for instance, it is beyond debate that freedom to engage in association for the advancement of beliefs and ideas is an inseparable aspect of the liberty assured by due process clause of the 14th Amendment. 
which embraces freedom of speech. Of course, it is immaterial whether the beliefs sought to be advanced by association pertain to political, economic, religious, or cultural matters, and state action, which may have the effect of curtailing the freedom to associate, is subject to the closest of scrutiny. When application of a public accommodations law was viewed as impinging on an organization's ability to present its message, the court found a First Amendment violation. Massachusetts could not require a private organizers of Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade to allow a particular group to march as a unit proclaiming their identity because the court held in Hurley versus Irish American um, to do so would require parade organizers to promote a message they did not wish to promote. Thus we see that the government recognizes that to restrict or require membership in an association is a violation of free speech and freedom of expression. An association has its own freedom of speech and association. And requiring a student association to allow leadership that is not in keeping with its own standards, principles, beliefs, and practices is a violation of the rights of the association as a whole and the members that make up such an association. Thank you. Now I'll receive questions. Thank you. Questions? Senator Razor, go ahead. Mr. Paper, we know that you are the chair of the Missouri Human Rights Commission, correct? Yes. Uh, are you just want to make sure are you affiliated uh, with any of our state institutions, state universities? No. In any way? No. You're not on the board of curators or boards or? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Anybody else testify in favor? Good morning, Mr. Senators. My name is Connor Brown. Uh, I'm uh, testifying here today as a Mizzou student and officer of the Mizzou College Republicans and Mizzou Students for Life. Uh, simply put, um, as previous witnesses have said, uh, this bill is common sense. Um, it closes a loophole left by university policy and protects advocacy groups like the ones I'm here representing today. Um, this bill would ensure that my groups and others like it aren't vulnerable to hostile members from within. Uh, it's necessary that um, we be able to freely select members and leaders in order to prevent the possibility of a hostile takeover. Uh, some groups currently don't have strong voting requirements, so in theory, all it would take is one opposing member and an overwhelming group of uh, friends to flood an organization's election, win it, and ultimately kill the organization. Uh, additionally, this bill would promote safety on Missouri campuses. Uh, throughout the school year as a member and later officer of Mizzou Students for Life, there was increased difficulty in ensuring member safety during an organization-sponsored event due to forced open registration of members, which allowed hostile members into group-specific conversations. Uh, this led to targeted threats against our group and uh, ultimately acts of vandalism. Um, I encourage you all to vote yes, and I'll take your questions. Thank you very much. Question, Senator Razor. Thank you for being here. As the Mizzou college Republicans planning to take over Mizzou College Democrats? Is that in the works? Uh, no, my, um, my group does not plan on taking over the College Democrats. Okay, and I can tell you as a Democrat, we are not organized enough to do that to you, so <laughs> you're safe. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Lance Kinzer. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Relations for First Amendment Partnership, where we have the privilege of working with some of the nation's largest faith-based communities on matters of common concern. In terms of the extent or ubiquity of this problem, um, I actually attend a weekly call with uh, general counsel level folks from national evangelical campus ministries where simply the issue of challenges faced by their clubs in being recognized or staying recognized is the topic of conversation. This has generated 
a significant amount of litigation even though the underlying law is clear. Um, the Iowa situation is actually illustrative of how these cases generally arise and why the state of Iowa and 16 states in addition to Iowa have decided that passing uh, clear statutes makes sense despite the fact that the case law is already clear. Um, going all the way back to the early 1970s, it's interesting how these cases initially emerged. Um, there were student groups at that point in time who generally would be seen as being more on the left, who were engaged in protests involving the Vietnam War and other activities that uh, apparently more conservative college administrators did not like. And so that led to a, a host of litigation which the ACLU was engaged in bringing on behalf of these student groups establishing um, a, a clear standard that in a case called Healy v. James involving students for a democratic society um, saying that viewpoint discrimination which is kind of the first point in the bill is unconstitutional. In other words what it said is once a university adopts a system where they are recognizing student groups they've created a limited public forum and it is black letter law um, that you cannot discriminate based upon viewpoint. The government cannot in a limited public forum. Um, that standard is so clear that at the University of Iowa in that case um, in two separate matters that went up to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, the, the, the circuit that Missouri sits in, um, viewpoint discrimination against faith-based campus groups uh, leading to their exclusion from campus was found not only to violate the Constitution but to violate it so clearly that there was no qualified immunity for the individual college administrators who had made that decision. In other words, they could be held personally liable. Uh, that resulted in an almost $2 million judgment against the University of Iowa. They decided to go ahead and indemnify the employees who had been found individually liable and the taxpayers ended up writing that check. Um, that 1972 case that said you can't discriminate based upon viewpoint against campus groups was followed up by a Missouri case in 1981, Widmar v. Vincent. In Widmar v. Vincent at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, the UMKC said we won't allow religious groups to meet in our classrooms because it would violate the establishment clause if there was prayer going on in there or something like that. And in an 8-1 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said that, that not only could uh, those groups meet in classrooms, but that having established a limited public forum, they could not regulate the content of the speech that occurred during those meetings. The question has been raised with respect to student um, taxpayer money, and I want to be clear, while there are, is general taxpayer money to keep the lights on uh, in a classroom and that sort of thing, the, the money that occasionally directly goes to a student group comes from student activity fee funds. Um, every student is in a posture where they are paying student activity fee funds that may go to groups that they disagree with. A Democrat student um, can't object to the fact that the college Republicans may apply for student activity fee funds. The U.S. Supreme Court's dealt with this issue repeatedly in Rosenberger v. Virginia 1995. Uh, they made it clear that fee funds cannot be held from a group merely because they promote or manifest a particular belief system. Uh, the problem is this and I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap up and conclude with this idea. How did, how does, how did these cases usually arise? We, we've heard some testimony and heard some questions regarding the possibility of club takeover. And while that is possible, and I'm not saying it never happens, it's not the thing that has me on a call with general counsel of, of evangelical campus ministries every week. Generally speaking, what is occurring is that universities themselves or increasingly common student government associations are at the outset before there's any controversy saying if your bylaws include standards for leadership we won't recognize you in the first place to begin with. That results in litigation candidly many of the works and groups that we work with um, aren't all that displeased. I mean ADF, Beckett, First Liberty they win these cases over and over again. But if you're a, you know, going into your senior year as the club leader for Christian Legal Society and uh, you uh, find out a couple weeks before 
the semester is to start, that you haven't been recognized, you can't participate in club day, you can't have your meetings on campus um, on the, in the same way that other groups can, you can't apply for that $500 grant that was going to help you. Um, if that happens, you can, once you figure out as a young kid, oh, I've got a right to go get a lawyer, and that lawyer goes down to federal court, and a, couple, a month or two later you get a piece of paper from a federal district court judge saying they shouldn't have done that to you. The, the amount of disruption, the, the articles in the student newspaper that say that this uh, club has been kicked off campus for their inappropriate activity is devastating to the operation of those groups and their ability. So uh, what 17 states have done and what we've seen work very well over and over again is to say let's have a clear standard in state law so that there's no confusion. Uh, we don't have to ask uh, general counsel who maybe don't deal with this issue a lot to look at, to, to come through the case law and student government associations with kids who are making these decisions who don't know the law have a very simple statute that they can be educated regarding. So I've probably spoken more Thank than you. I should have, but I'll answer questions. Questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank Anybody you. else testify in favor? Please be brief. Ditto, or I, I agree, is a perfectly acceptable uh, testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is John Coleman. I'm legislative counsel for the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, also known as FIRE. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to protecting freedom of speech. Uh, FIRE supports the HB 136. We just want to address any <clears throat> arguments that in the wake of the Supreme Court uh, decision in CLS Martinez that this bill is unconstitutional. It is not un unconstitutional. In CLS, the Supreme Court held that public universities do not violate students' First Amendment right to freedom of association when they require official student organizations to accept all students as voting members and leaders, provided those policies are truly apl applied across the board. In other words, under CLS, these policies are permissive. That's it. The holding does not require all, all commerce policies. I, I, in order to be brief, I, I can cut it off there. Thank you. thank you. I appreciate that. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Good morning, Chair and Committee. My name is Kurt Wickmer, and I represent the Missouri Catholic Conference. I'd like to go on record in support of this bill. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Anybody testify in opposition? Please come forward. My name is Brian Kaler, and I'm a Baptist minister and a former public university professor where I served as a faculty advisor to a student organization. Uh, and I have problems with this legislation primarily because what it does is it allows some groups to create exclusionary policies, but not all universities. So all of them are in the pot for funding, but now some of them get to have extra special rights over other groups. Uh, and we've heard some references to litigation. I mean, the Iowa case, for instance, this, this lawsuit, this legislation doesn't actually address what went wrong in Iowa. The problem at the University of Iowa was that the university officials did not treat all groups the same. So they targeted one group when, while they allowed other groups to have exclusionary policies. And so that's exactly what this legislation does in the same thing. It allows some groups to be exclusionary and not allowing others. And so I think we need to allow, treat all groups on campus equally, <laughs> which is either an all-comers policy for all or an exclusionary policy for all. This legislation does neither of those. I also think it, at heart it doesn't respect our college students and their understanding of their own beliefs and their own participation in their own democracy. We've heard a lot of comments about a potential takeover uh, when in reality groups, organizations change their own beliefs over time and this would not allow the students to decide, hey, this is what we believe and this is who we want in leadership. This is who we are going to elect in a free and fair election. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in opposition? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Sharon Galway jones here today on behalf of uh, the Missouri State Conference of the NAACP and PROMO. There's been a lot of discussion about religious organizations and leadership, and I want to clarify for the committee that this bill goes much further than that. This bill includes any group with an ideological or political belief, and it includes members and statements made by the organization as well as the leadership. So what that means is you could have a white national group go to student government and say, we want all the same funding as the Christian Leadership Council or whatever else, or the Democrats Club or whatever else. They would then be able to illegally discriminate on campus under this law, on not only their leadership, but also their membership. So I just want to point out that this is different than what those other 17 states have done. Most of those laws are limited to deeply held religious beliefs and not going so far as all ideologies. And also most of those laws are not, um, I believe most of those are limited to the leadership question, not all members. So, um, you know, the Constitution, our job is, or your job as governance is to balance rights, right? This is a rights balancing question. Both kinds of people in this world, all kinds, have First Amendment rights. We have to figure out how to balance those. The way to do that is to look at the protected classes in our law and in our Constitution, and this bill would allow groups to violate those laws in favor of being able to hide behind a, relig a religious or ideological statement. So I would just ask the committee to either make some serious amendments or vote this down. Um, thank you. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in opposition? Please come forward. Chair Bernsketter and members of the committee, my name is Lexi Hall and I am a registered lobbyist and legislative director for the Associated Students of the University of Missouri, or ASUM. I'm also a graduate student in public policy at Mizzou. ASUM is a nonpartisan student advocacy organization that speaks for the 75,000 plus students across the University of Missouri system. We come before the committee today in opposition to House Bill 136 for several reasons. This bill grants belief-based organizations access to university funding, regardless of the nature of the sincerely held beliefs to which they require leaders to prescribe. Usually, this is fine, unless those beliefs operate outside of anti-discrimination laws. If a belief-based organization has a sincerely held belief that leaders cannot identify with a certain protected class, such as women, people of color, LGBTQ plus people, et cetera, that group would then be in violation of university, state, and federal level anti-discrimination laws. On our campuses and in our communities, there are plenty of organizations that require leaders to hold sincerely held beliefs that would traditionally violate anti-discrimination laws. However, because these organizations are not in compliance with anti-discrimination laws, they don't receive public funding. Why would we make an exception for belief-based student organizations? In fact, providing public funding to belief-based student organizations that operate outside of anti-discrimination policies will only codify and exacerbate existing discrimination practices on campus. Based on results from our 2022 annual survey of students in the UM system, 9% of the students who reported experiencing racial discrimination, 9% of students who reported experiencing gender discrimination, 11% of students who reported experiencing sexual preference discrimination, and 14% of students who reported experiencing religious discrimination on campus identified student organizations as the source of that discrimination. This bill would reward that discrimination with public funding, not rectify it. For these reasons, we respectfully ask for the committee's opposition to House Bill 136, and I can take any questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Anybody else testify in opposition, please come forward. Anybody for informational purposes only? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 136. Um, since we're at the end of session, last few days, I'd like to hold an executive session on the bills we just heard. I move we enter executive session. Do I have a second? 
I have a second. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. We are in executive session. Uh, the first bill is Representative Houck's bill dealing with the dead. Uh, House Bill 557. I move that House Bill 557 be brought before the committee. Do I have a second? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The bill is for the committee. I have a committee substitute. It ends in point 03C. It was distributed earlier this week. Uh, Senator Razor, would you like to explain the substitute? Yes, this just added a bill that I had introduced um, as we tried to find a vehicle for it. Uh, there are surprisingly few. Um, Chris Sifford was a uh, an aide to Governor Carnahan, who uh, sadly passed away in the, the tragic accident in 2000. Um, he is the cousin to my chief of staff. And as often happens, and rightfully so perhaps, uh, the news reported it as the governor, his son, and an aide. Uh, and this just recognizes him on his birthday as Chris Sifford Day, so that we remember those that work for us and, and are on staff and nonpartisan staff, they do a great service for the people of Missouri. Is there any discussion on that amendment? Um, you know, I think he probably would have found it humorous that we, we put it here. There isn't a naming bill going through that's not about roads that has made it to us yet, so he is a deceased person. And, and that is the connection. Any other discussion on the amendment? I move that Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 557 be adopted. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. I move that Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 557 be voted due pass. Do I have a second? I have a second. Matt, please call the roll to vote. Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 557. Out of committee, do pass. Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 557. Senators Burnsgetter. Aye. Aye. Searpoint. Aye. Beck. Black. Aye. Bratton. Huff. Razor. Aye. 4 0. By your vote of 4 0, the motion carries. Um, House Bill 782, public advertisements, as Representative McGall's bill, dealing with public advertisements. I move that House Bill 782 be brought before the committee. Do I have a second? <coughs> I have a second. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The bill is for the committee. Uh, I have a committee substitute. It ends in point O two C. It was distributed yesterday. It adds a provision similar to seven, House Bill 752 dealing with publications of notices for public product projects. It adds a provision following allowing Cass County to modify their publication of notice for county, county planning boards. Uh, is there any discussion on those amendments? Seeing none, I move that Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 782 be, be adopted. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. I move that Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 782 be voted due pass. Do I have a second? I have a second. Matt, please call the roll to vote Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 782 out of committee due pass. Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 782. Senators Burnsgetter. Aye. Aye. Searpoy. Aye. Beck. Black. Aye. Aye. Bratton. Huff. Razor. Aye. Four zero. By your vote of 4 0, the motion carries. House Bill 934, Employee Benefits Plan, Representative Hovis Bill, dealing with benefit plans. I move that House Bill 934 be brought forward to the committee. Do I have a second? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The bill is for a committee. Uh, I also have a committee sub on this one. It ends in point 04C. It was distributed yesterday. It makes technical changes to the sheriff's retirement language. It adds provisions regarding the Kansas City PSRS retirement program members to allow them to work in critical shortage districts. And it makes other technical changes to the legislation in the House bill. I move that Senate committee substitute for House Bill 934 be adopted. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. 
All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. I move that Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 934 be voted due pass. Do I have a second? I have a second. Matt, please call the roll to vote Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 934 out of committee due pass. Senate Committee substitute for House Bill 934. Senators Bernsketter. Aye. Aye. Sirpoy. Aye. Beck. Black. Aye. Aye. Bratton. Huff. Razor. Aye. Aye. Four zero. By your vote, vote of 4 0. The motion carries. House Bill 136, Representative Hudson's bill dealing with the belief based student association. I move that House Bill 136 be brought before the committee. Do I have a second? All the favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The bill is for the committee. I move that House Bill 136 be voted due pass. Do I have a second? I have a second. Matt, please call the roll to vote House Bill 136 out of committee. Do pass. House Bill 136, Senators Bernsketter. Aye. Aye. Searpoy. Aye. Beck. Black. Aye. Aye. Bratton. Huff. Razor. Yeah. No. 3 1. By your vote of 3 1, the motion carries. I move we exit executive session. Do I have a second? I have a second. All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. We're out of executive session. I move we adjourn. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. We're adjourned.